Well, good morning, RBC. We are glad you are here. Special welcome if you're joining us on Facebook Live. And if you're visiting this morning, we are so honored that you are with us. My name is CJ, and I'm the lead pastor here. And we are honored that you joined us this morning. Don't forget, next week, if you're new here and have never been to a pizza with the pastors, we would love for you to hang out after second service with the staff. We want to get to know you a little bit better. So, boy, put that on your calendar. Um, if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 John 2. We're going to be in 1 John 2 today. We are continuing our series in 1 John. If you're just, just joining us on first, uh, our first week in the series, this is week number three. Our first week, we were introduced to the character of John the Evangelist or John the Disciple. Uh, we learned uh, that though he started his life as a rough fisherman, um, his favorite nickname for himself was the beloved disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved. And uh, we, we kind of learned about this man and his tender heart that came of a lifetime of walking beside Jesus. We also were introduced to some other characters. And this is, uh, this is history, and I don't know how much this interests you, but I found it really fascinating. We were introduced to these characters named the Gnostics. And during the time that John was doing his public ministry and writing 1 John, this group of people called the Gnostics were very popular. Now, they had a habit of taking different religions and blending them together to make this weird, warmed-over, leftover religion. It was just kind of this weird thing. Um, do you guys ever remember growing up in elementary school, you would always go and look at the menu uh, or what, what was being served? Actually, I, now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, I'm like, did they publish menus when I went to elementary school? I don't remember them doing that, but I remember my kids, do when they would publish the menus and they would have this thing called Cook's Choice. Remember Cook's Choice? You know what that was, right? Yeah, they were cleaning out the fridge, right? They were making goulash out of last week's spaghetti. <laughs> you know, it kind of made this like really weird mixture, like leftovers, and nobody loved Cook's Choice. You know what we did love? Pizza cut in a square. Why was that so awesome? I don't know. Uh, that was great. Anyway, now I'm hungry, and uh, the Gnostics were like the cook's choice of religion. They just kind of took all this different stuff, put it in a pile, and then patted themselves on the back because they thought they were really smart. And uh, they, they fancied themselves philosophers, and they actually had written some fan fiction out of Scripture that the early church went, that, that doesn't even sort of accurate. Like, they knew from the very beginning. Um, one, of the, one of those things, like a little pop cultural reference for you, maybe you remember in the mid-2000s, a movie came out called, uh, called uh, The Da Vinci Code? And it was based on a book. Remember that? Well, that book, that book is kind of taken from some Gnostic thought. And one of the really weird things that they pitched in that book, um, the early Christians absolutely believed that Jesus was divine. They, the first 300 years, I went and did some research this week, the first 300 years of Christianity, Jesus being the Son of God was not even up for debate. And yet these Gnostics came along and went, ah, we think he was just a good teacher, but he certainly wasn't divine. And one of the things that came out of that book that was, came out of some of the Gnostic writings is that Jesus didn't actually ascend into heaven because he wasn't actually divine. He didn't actually die for our sins and come back and be resurrected. And he didn't ascend into heaven. In fact, he and Mary Magdalene got married and they moved to France and they had babies. And they became the Knights Templar. Who, we don't even know who they... <laughs> this is me shoveling manure. You, you get that reference. We're a rural community, right? I can get away with that here, can't I? <laughs> anyway, the early church read these Gnostic gospels, these Gnostic writings, and went, "That's a, we're not believing that. That's crazy. So a lot of what we're reading is John's answer to Gnosticism. Him going, look, guys, Jesus is the Son of God, and we really are genuine followers of him. And so we're on this path of trying to come up with what our tests of authenticity are. Now, last week, we learned that one of the tests of authenticity is that if you're really saved, really a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, it starts with being real about God and being real about your own sin problem. And it was a call for us as believers to be authentic and transparent when we talk about the state of our heart. 
And that most people are on this journey to go, look, the stuff, the brokenness in my life is someone else's fault, but probably a little bit of my fault. And I know that there's probably a God. And I know that he's probably not really happy with some of the choices I've made. So maybe if I go to church a little bit, or if I'd be good enough, maybe I can, maybe I can make things go in my favor. Well, then this is what the Gnostics were trying to do, trying to learn enough so that they would be better people. And John goes, no, God is the light. You're not the light. Your light is broken. Don't follow the light in your own heart. The light in your heart is sinful. But let's come and be honest that God is the light. Surrender our hearts to him. Repent and let him clean us up. And we talked about to be authentic, one of the tests of authenticity is we have to be real about our own sin. And when we do, 1 John 1, 9, your memory verse last week was this. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. The light inside you is broken. If you're trying to be good enough because of some light that you have within, it's still dark and broken at times. But if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The true light is God shining through us. So the first test of our authenticity is to be real about our sin. And, and I, love, I love what he says in um, I love what he says in 1 John 2, 1 to 2. And, and we read this last week, but I want to reiterate it. It says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but for those of the whole world. And so he uses the word advocate. And I was thinking about this. Advocate is really um, an, another word for lawyer, right? I mean, Jesus right now is your lawyer in front of God. Do you sin? Yes, you do. And who's there accusing you of that? The enemy. But who's fighting on your behalf? Jesus. And I think we kind of undervalue that unless you've ever actually had to hire a lawyer. Has anyone ever had to hire a lawyer? That, my friends, is a very expensive endeavor. I know from experience. I will tell you that story sometime. Not a criminal lawyer. I wasn't in trouble. Just (laughs) we'll get to it someday. Okay. But what is a going rate for a good lawyer these days? Three hundred, four hundred dollars an hour, five hundred dollars an hour? To think that the God of the universe and his son Jesus, Jesus sits at his right hand and advocates for you. And when the enemy comes and shows up. And says, hey, God, did you see Scott the other day? Scott was out of control. He was just rude and he was crazy. And and God goes, and Jesus goes, hey, that never happened. And Satan goes, of course it did. I watched it. And Jesus goes, no. Because the Bible says God, God separates our sin as far as from the east as from the west. And he remembers them no more. It's like it never happened. So when God looks at us on the other side of confessing our sins, Jesus advocates. In fact, he says he's the atoning sacrifice, which means that his righteousness is clothed on you. And so when Satan comes and actually probably makes some pretty legit statements about the condition of our heart to God, Jesus goes, no, that never happened because it's covered by my atoning sacrifice for you. My friends, that is the advocate we have in, in Jesus. He's not just a good lawyer. He's a lawyer that makes our darkness clean and innocent in God's eyes. To think that Jesus right now is having a conversation with God, defending you. And God goes, yep, that's it. My friends, the light's not found in us. The light's found in in God, who there's no darkness. Now, this is a test of authenticity, is whether or not we're real with our sin. So today we're going to look at a couple other tests of authenticity uh, that John talks about. Again, going, here's the difference between you and the Gnostics. If you're really a believer, this is what's true of you. Okay? And we're going to be looking for verse 3 through verse 11 this morning of chapter 2 of 1 John. Um, a couple months ago, I told you the story. I was working at a, in college. I had lots of jobs in college. One of the college jobs I worked was at a jewelry store at the mall. And they told you stories about this young lady coming in. She has a big old diamond ring, but she wanted to see other diamond rings. And I said, why do you want another diamond ring? That one's huge. And she goes, oh, this one's fake. And I used our tester, and it was real. And she was real excited, and I did not sell any rings that day. Um, but... <laughs> I don't know if you know this, you, there's also ways to tell whether or not your gold is real. Is anyone wearing 
wearing gold jewelry today? You like a gold? Yeah, take it off. I want you to take it off. Do you know if it's real or not? Can I teach you how to, how to tell whether or not your gold jewelry is real or not? Well, well, the easiest way to tell is that modern gold jewelry has a stamp on the inside of it. So look on the inside. My, my jewelry is, by the way, rubber because I lose stuff. I have not seen my wedding band in a decade. <laughs> These, on the other hand, are $4 on Amazon. Um, <laughs> but if you look on the inside of your gold jewelry, or maybe on the back if it's a necklace or something, you'll see a stamp if it's authentic. That's called a jeweler stamp. And that jeweler stamp, if it's 100% gold, it will tell you what grade of gold it is. If it's 8, ca- eight carat, 10 carat, 14 carat, or 24 carat. 24 carat gold, if you don't know, is 99.9% pure gold. Okay? However, if you look and it doesn't say 8K or 10K or 14K or 24K on it, but instead it says GP, that means that the core of your piece is probably silver or nickel, and it just has a very thin coat of gold around the outside. It's gold plated. Maybe it says HGP, which is heavy gold plate, which means that it's much thicker. So that's one way to tell if your gold jewelry is authentic. Another way to tell if your gold jewelry is authentic, I found this out that some people have taken their gold jewelry and putting it in a cup of water, and it floats. If your ring floats, it's fake. Okay, gold doesn't float. Um, If you take your jewelry off and it leaves a nice dark ring around your skin, also fake. If you take a magnet to your gold jewelry, and it sticks. Not real. It's fake. Okay? And then one of, one of this, I, just, I did learn this this week. If you take an unglazed ceramic tile and rub your ring or your jewelry against a ceramic tile and it sparkles gold, it's real. If it turns dark, it's fake. Okay? So there's some ways to tell whether or not your gold jewelry is real or not. Some of you are looking at your ring that your beloved gave to you on your engagement day, and now you're thinking he's the cheapest person in the world. So I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm available this week for marriage counseling. Um, There are tests to tell whether or not our faith is real. And in comparison to the Gnostics, this was very important to John to help people understand whether or not they were truly born again, whether or not they truly had an original faith. And so today we're going to look at some of these. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at um, we're going to be looking at verses three to six. And so I'm going to start. I'm going to start just start with that first one. And the first test of authenticity is be obedient. Okay. So John two three through six says this. Uh, My little children, I'm writing these, oh, nope, sorry, verse 3, this is how we know that we know him, all right? You want to know whether or not your, 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 your faith is authentic or not? This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I've come to know him, but does not keep his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. It's a fake. Verse 5, whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we're in him. The one who says he, he remains in him should walk as he walked. So our first test of authenticity this morning, or our second one of the series, is to be obedient. Be obedient. Do what God asks you. Because there's a couple reasons why he says you should be obedient. One, he says you will know him. You will know that you know him. Uh, this is how we know that we know him, if we're obedient. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, an old Lutheran pastor during World War II, wrote this. He says, the only he who believes is obedient. Only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Or, as an ancient ancient Christian writer named Gregory the Great put it, we can be said to be loving God only to the extent that we are keeping his commands. We can be said to loving that we could be said to be loving God only to the extent in which we're keeping his commands. Our love and the demonstration of our love for God, the demonstration of our salvation in Jesus Christ is made whether or not we're being obedient. We're actually doing what he said. If we keep his commands, we truly learn who he is. We truly know God because his, through obedience and experience. So if we're being obedient and we're joining God's uh, mission and doing what he says to us to do is if our life as believers is is continuously reading his word and allowing him to speak to us and say hey here's what i need you to do and we're obedient to that a couple things happen first of all we learn and know his nature 
and his, and his will. We become apprentices of God by being obedient. And when, when we're following and, do, and joining him on his redemptive mission, okay, we learn his nature and will. We learn, when, when, when God asks us to come and join and share the gospel, what we learn some things is we learn the nature of mercy. We learn the nature of justice. We learn the nature of holiness. When we practice who, who, his, his love, mercy, justice, and holiness, we put those things on ourselves. When we put on holiness, we understand God's holy nature better. So we discover a deep intimacy with the Creator by being obedient. Secondly, we form a relationship with Him. Obedience opens the door for us to have a relationship with God based on trust and healthy communication. We get invited to participate in His redemptive plan, and cooperation with God bonds our hearts to Him. When we work together doing what the Lord has set out for us to do, our hearts are bonded to Him. Now imagine if you're in charge of a team at work, and you put together a team to accomplish a task and you lay out all the goals and tasks that you are going to accomplish as a team but one person on the team is pushing in a different direction you know they are actively subverting or at least not participating in the stated goals of the team gonna be hard to really want to grab a burger after work with that guy isn't it because you know he's sabotaging you When we have different goals than than God, it breaks our relationship with Him and it sabotages our our mission with Him. Or or flip it around the other way. Maybe maybe you have been in a situation where you've had a team and you've been working on a team and leading a team, and one of your teammates may be participating in the same goals, but they're just hostile. Like they hate you. Like they they just are, 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 are dragging you down behind your back. It's hard in that situation to build trust and work together towards a common goal. So when we're obedient to what God commands us to do, it becomes the basis of our relationship with him. We grow in our love with Jesus when we're working with him, alongside of him, for the same goals that he had. It causes transformation in our hearts. When we're being obedient, we change and become more like him. And finally, we fellowship with others who are, have similar goals. We find that we have community with other believers that are on the same path. When we're obedient to what God asks us to do, we are put in community with other peoples with the same goals. So the opposite is also true. If we aren't being obedient, what right do we have? What, 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 can we, what basis do we have to claim that we love God in any way. Because the opposite is what's evident in our life. So one of the tests of authenticity is being obedient. So the question to you this morning is in what ways have you discovered the nature of God because you've chosen that form of radical obedience? Okay, another reason why we need to be obedient, he tells us, is because we know what, we learned what it means to love perfectly. He says in verse 5, Truly in him, the love of God is made complete. When is it made complete and perfect? When we obey and keep his word. Knowing God's love is made complete and perfected in us through obedience. Um, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, I've been a coffee snob for many years. Okay? Um, It started in college when one of my other jobs was I was a waiter at a really fancy uh, restaurant. In fact, it was a really fancy restaurant in Des Moines, Iowa. And I know what you're thinking. Wow, must be first class. <laughs> Des Moines actually is kind of a foodie town. And I went to work for this place called Cozy Cucina. That's Italian for little kitchen because it had a little kitchen. And, uh, but uh, what they did have at the server station was this $30,000 espresso machine. And they had all these really fancy, tall glass mugs. 
And it was so fun to make all these really cool uh, coffee drinks and layer them. So you've got espresso and you've got your you know, steamed milk and you've got a layer of raspberry syrup maybe and the froth milk and whipped cream on top. It was really pretty. So I really kind of fell in love with being a coffee snob, um, which is why I cannot go to Starbucks ever. <laughs> that stuff is, you know what, I, we're not going to go there. Um, <laughs> shame on you. Uh, but lately, even though I'm kind of a coffee snob, I love single source coffees too. I, I'm starting to become good enough. I can tell where a coffee's from by the way it tastes. Uh, so I, I prefer Central American coffees. But uh, lately, I've been into tea uh, because of my throat. I don't know if you've noticed, but I yell sometimes. I don't know why, but uh, I do, and it's taken its toll on my throat. One day, I'm going to be one of these gravelly old preachers that speaks with the authority of God because my throat's trashed. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I learned that there's a couple, uh, by the way, uh, my favorite is a chai tea, so good. Um, but I try to do tea on Sunday mornings to kind of soothe my throat. But I've noticed that there are two types of way people make tea, right? They pour their hot water, and they'll take the tea bag, and they'll just put it in there and just steep it river so gently. And then there are some of us who just go full send and just drop that tea bag in there and let it soak because we want it all, Right? Some of us in our faith, by the way, I stole that illustration from Tony Evans, but some of us are, are like people, our faith is like people who just dip a toe in and out, in and out, in and out. We're in to an extent. We'll go to church. We'll be a nice person. In and out. But whether or not we're all in, happens when we're being obedient to what God calls us to do. So in what ways is your obedience evidenced by a wholehearted devotion to Jesus? Third, the reason he gives us is we'll know we're abiding in Christ. Verse 6 says, if we're obedient, the one who says he remains in him will walk just as he walked. We'll abide in Christ, which means his presence will be on us and we'll remain there. Okay, and it's really interesting to me, it's kind of funny that these Gnostics in context, these Gnostics in the early Romans got in the habit of seeing early believers, Christians, who were following Christ, and they started, they started trying to insult them. And the insult they came up for them was calling them little Christ. Look at these little Christs everywhere. These little Christs. And it's the basis of the word Christian. Do you know that the word Christian was originally a slang slur against Christ followers because the early Christ followers were trying to obey Jesus by, by, by modeling him, by, by looking like him, by doing what he did. And so they became to be, they tried to insult him by calling that. It's been said that imitation is the most sincerest form of flattery, but I also think it's true that imitation is the most sincerest form of obedience. So ask yourself the question, in what ways has my commitment to Jesus been reflected in the way that I live? How are people around me seeing Jesus through me? Okay, so test of authenticity number two is to be obedient. Now, super wild, he goes on to tell us what test of authenticity number three is, which is love like Jesus. Now, I know what you're saying. He says, be obedient to God's commands and the command to love. And you're like, I've heard that before. Yes, you have. Verse seven, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have heard from the beginning. The old command is the word that you have heard. Yes, I'm writing you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is shining. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in darkness until now, but the one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother and sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So the, so the third test of authenticity is to love like Jesus. And I love how John kind of, I mean, this is the holy word of God, so I don't want to, I don't know how this is going to take you. But he's kind of stumbling over his words. He's like, I want to teach you a new commandment, but it's kind of an old commandment. But it's kind of new, but it's old. But it's, old. it's like the one you've heard from the beginning. Like, he's pitching this like, like this isn't the first time you've heard this. But I want, it, I want it to renew this in your heart. In fact, um, he says that, he actually starts by saying, I'm not writing a new commandment, but an old commandment that you've heard from the beginning. 
The commandment to love like Jesus has been around since the beginning. And that's what he's alluding to is the fact that this is, this is, since God has been speaking to man, this has been his commandment, to love other people. In fact, if you remember back in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus comes along and says, I give you a new commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus has already done this shtick where he comes along and says, I'm giving you a new commandment based on an old commandment. And John's coming along going, I'm giving you a new, new, new commandment based on an old, old, old commandment. You know, like he's kind of tripping on his word. I think it was funny. Anyway, um, <laughs> this, I guess the big takeaway is that this is the big one. All right? If you lose everything else, if you're going to be obedient to one command, just one, this is it. He's doubling down. Do you know what double down means? It's a poker term. Don't email me. <laughs> I'm sorry if, you know, your great-great-grandpa lost everything in a poker game in, in World War I. Um, <laughs> I have gotten that email before, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a poker term that comes from blackjack where... If you want to get another card, you have to double your bet. But we use it in popular slang to go, it's it ref, doubling down refers to re-upping your position or doubling your position or sticking by with what you, becoming res, resolute in a position or undertaking. <coughs> Excuse me. So John is doubling down on loving like Jesus. In fact, an old, an old Christian writer named Beattie, the Venerable said, God's commandment to love was old because it's been around since the beginning of time. But it was also new because once the darkness had taken away, it poured the desire for new light in our hearts. The reason why John in this passage can come along and go, but this is a new commandment, is because something had changed. And what had changed was this is the first time it had been written since the resurrection of Christ. Because again, when God tells the people to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself, John is writing from the position is, how, how, does, how did God love us? Jesus came and died for us. This is on the other side of the resurrection where Jesus came, born, lived a perfect life, died for you, came back from the grave to bury our sins forever, and he's saying love like that. So John's going, this is kind of a new thing, Right? The, the darkness is gone. The light is here. The light of Christ is here on this side of the resurrection. How do we love like Jesus did? It requires sacrifice. He's going he's to cost you. In the light of Jesus' resurrection, the ultimate sign of love is how we sacrifice for other people. So the big commandment, the true test of our faith, is are you loving like Jesus? Are you sacrificing for others? It's also shown in reflecting God's love in him shining through us. Right? Because he's also objecting to that whole notion that the light comes from within you. And so he says, I'm writing you a new command in verse 8, which is true of him and in you, that the darkness is passing away, and the true light is shining through you. When sacrificial love shines through us, that's the true light of Christ living through us. That's the truest test of authenticity of our faith. So the question to you is, how is your sacrificial love for other people shining through you and revealing God in you, revealing Christ shining through you through your sacrificial love for other people? And that's what John's saying. On this side of the cross, we gotta, we got to show, show people that God exists by Jesus living through us. So how are you reflecting God's love? And then, and then finally... We reflect God's, we love like Jesus when we show unity to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because he, he, he takes a turn here and points it towards one another. So in verse 9, he says, The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in darkness until now. And the one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light. And there's no cause of stumbling. So the, the last way we love like Jesus is how we treat other believers. And... and RBC, you're a loving church. You're the most loving church I've ever been a part of. But my experience as a professional Christian, having been in lots of churches, having grown up in a really conservative little Baptist church in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, is those people love me, so don't, don't misunderstand me. But I also am keenly aware of what happens in our faith to people who have been around who've been around their faith for a long time. It's one thing 
for you and I to read Scripture and have the Holy Spirit speak to us and say, this is something I don't think you should be a part of. It's not good for you. So, some of us in the room can participate in some things, like playing poker. Some of us can't. And perhaps for you, it is a, it's, a, it's a conviction. It's a biblical conviction for you to go, I can't be a part of that. But I've seen what happens when we start taking those biblical convictions in our life and start slamming them down on other people. I've also seen what happens when it's very obvious they're not biblical convictions at all. They're just preferences. Look, we all have things we like, okay? We have things we dislike. Eh, I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an example. Um, a year ago, our decorating team painted, painted this black up here. And, and, and I'm a, you know, Becky and I take a lot of pictures. We're photographers. We love contrast. We don't do it because we, we like black walls. We do it because we like everything in front of it really pops, right? So we're, we're building a house right now when we paint this week, and we've chosen a very dark color for our house. I know you're thinking, that's not your style. Good, good for you. That's fine. We do it because everything that you put in front of it, when you put a photo on the wall, a bright photo from the beach on a black wall, what's the object of, what's the center of attention? It draws you right to it. We have white, we have white plants, like, like we've had some up here. With white. You put that against a black wall, that really pops, okay? Our fireplace is just going to be white shiplap, but it's going to really stand out against the backdrop of that black. It's con heavy contrast. So I, I was at a church in Iowa 12 years ago, and I was, I was a youth pastor, and I was with my worship guy, and we were like, hey, man, let's, let's do this. So we painted the front of the, front of the sanctuary black. Because he was in the process of creating these really nice LED, uh, d you know, kind of designs and stuff. It was really cool. But old, Sh old Sharon walked in. I mean, we had just got done painting it, putting all this work into it. She walked in and said, oh, good, you turned the front of my church into the gates of hell. And I was like, don't mind her, Justin. <laughs> it was so rude. If you knew Sharon, you know that's that's, that's the thing. But... Um, I, I gotta be honest with you. I've been around believers for a really long time. Goodness. We can make our preferences into something we can easily smack other believers over the head with. And maybe you felt that. I have over the years. I mean, I've worked professionally on s church staffs where I've been treated so rudely. So rudely. The things said are so unprofessional. And, and the, the, way, the way people treat each other, I, I've been on a handful of fire departments where I've only ever been treated professionally, where if I made a mistake, somebody would come and say, hey, let's sit and talk about this and see how we can grow, because I need you strong, because when you're strong, I'm strong, and when I'm strong, you're strong. When you look good, I look good, and when I look good, you look good, and when we look good together, that's when we work as a team. And friends, the Christian army is the only one that shoots its wounded. And we do that. And so, i, I got to be honest with you as we close up here. I really, really struggled with this sermon just from the fact of, I mean, really, really the, the base of the sermon is that the big takeaway that you're supposed to walk away from here is follow God's commands of loving one another, okay? Not exactly the deepest of Christian thought, right? Like, that's the obvious, that's the one, that's, one, that's Christianity 101. Love one another as Christ loved us, right? That's, that's the big takeaway. But then this week, something happened, and I went, well, there it is, right there. We got room to grow. Um, in 2018, 2019, I forget, I was invited to this conference called Stronger Men, okay? It's in Springfield, Missouri, and some of you have been paying attention to the news, you know what I'm talking about here. Um... It was a men conference with thousands of other men, and it's in this big arena in, in Springfield, Missouri. And when we got there, I knew nothing of the conference. At the beginning of the first session, the lights go out, and we're all sitting, maybe 10,000 dudes sitting in the dark in this arena. And the main stage in the middle of the room explodes, and I'm talking fireballs to the ceiling. Boom! And all of a sudden, this heavy, rhythmic music comes on. And there are men in tactical gear carrying M5s, rappelling out of the ceiling. Okay? 
and there's a shadowy figure who emerges on the stage like a terrorist and he's threatening the whole crowd and these guys repel out of the thing. They are throwing grenades down on the stage that are exploding somehow, okay? And then at the height of it, an explosion happens at the main door and a full-size military tank, I kid you not, comes through fireballs and it is shooting out of its turret into the crowd and it smashes cars all the way up and the guy jumps out of it and they have a full on like kung fu battle on the stage. It was the most testosterone grunt fest I've ever been a part of. I just went, I need an excedrin and a nap. I don't know what is happening right now. Okay. At the end of, so the speaker comes out and he does this whole thing. It was really a great message. And at the end, the MC goes, man, that was really great. Let's give him a round of applause. I just have a question for you. And a microphone comes down from the ceiling. He goes, are you ready to rumble? And all of a sudden, yeah. In a full octagon that we did not know, an MMA octagon was in the ceiling. We did not know it was there. It comes down and there's an MMA match right at the end of the sermon. Okay. If anyone wants to put on gloves when this is all over again, it was, we can make that happen. Uh, I'm just sitting here going, whoo, I don't know if that was the Holy Spirit or the flashing fireballs, but it moved me, right? Well, that conference happened this week, this weekend in Springfield, the same conference, only their theme this year was Acrobat. Um, they had, you know, stunts and stuff, and um, one of the keynote speakers is a guy named Mark Driscoll, and I don't know if you know that name, but if you've ever listened to the podcast on Spotify called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, he was a church planter in the early 2000s um, that, really, um, that really got a hold of my heart. Like uh, he's, he's preached the only sermon that's ever made me sob, um, but he also had some real leadership deficits, and it caused this mega church that he planted of 15,000 people to just implode. And... Uh, because he had a really brash personality and it was kind of kind of abusive in some ways and uh, he, he's since planted a church in in Arizona and he was a keynote speaker at this thing well like I said the theme of this conference this weekend was uh, like acrobats so they had different acrobatic things and, and one of the things that they had at the beginning to start this conference off at their keynote th- or the beginning of this first keynote session this time they had a guy get up on stage and they had a pole in the middle of the stage, and the guy got up, took his shirt off, climbed the pole, and swallowed a sword. Okay, the, the optics of that were not great. <laughs> okay, and Mark Driscoll, the, one of the keynote speakers, gets up and goes, he compared it in, in, in some words to what would happen in a seedy gentleman's club. Okay. He goes, I got to call this out. I got to rebuke this. This is the spirit. He got the spirit of Jezebel. And everybody that watched what he said, and then the clip of that happening went, what were they thinking? How terrible that they would start to, comp- I mean, it really, the optics of it weren't great. It wasn't very wise, right? It was a mistake, probably to put it that way. Well, then the pastor of the church gets up and goes, hey, you're out of line. And these two guys have exchanged words on stage. Two megachurch pastors having these words now they came back up on stage later and kind of reconciled but all week has been all week if you're in the twitter sphere has been this public fight between these two guys back and forth on whether or not that was appropriate well i was in the camp originally when i first saw it the bible says that the first to make his case appears right and i went yeah that was pretty dumb to have a what looked like a stripper pole in the middle of a men's conference where the guy takes his shirt off and climbs up and it's like it's weird I said, why would you do that? It didn't make any sense. And I thought, I thought at first I thought he was right. Turns out that the guy who did that um, has a past, but he surrendered his heart to Christ. He became born again, attends a church in, in Los Angeles, and now he, now he does this as a feat of strength. And, and then in the greater context, learning the greater context that there was acrobats and a whole kind of that whole feats of, feats of daring thing, all of a sudden I'm like, well, that kind of, that isn't as, bad as I thought it was, and the pastor kind of made a point that he could have, the speaker could have pulled him aside rather than making a big spectacle out of it, right? So I'm sitting here at the end of this going, okay, there, there are arguments both ways, and I don't know who won the argument, but I could tell you who lost. The body of Christ lost. 
Because I'm watching this play out online, and it has brought nothing but the worst out of people. I've had six people from my past text me and go, what do you think of the Mark Hill or the Mark Driscoll, James River thing? And I'm like, well, I think it's a black mark on, I think it's a black eye for all of us. This ought not be how we handle stuff. And I'll just use that as an illustration to go, look, everyone in this room, we all have our preferences. Everyone in this room has a history. You have a walk with God that's different than mine. You, the Lord, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and said there are things that you shouldn't be a part of that he hasn't said to me. I want to tell you something that's very true when we talk about brothers and sisters in Christ having unity. Is that two people, two believers who love like Jesus, who love the Lord and are listening to the Holy Spirit and being obedient as they can, two believers that have the Holy Spirit speak to them can still come to different conclusions about things. We can interpret Scripture different. Okay, we can. We can, we can have different values and different beliefs. But the truth of the matter is that that, that speaker or that writer named Beattie, he said this, the person who loves his brother puts up with everything for the sake of unity. Such an attitude keeps us from hurting anyone unduly. So relationships and our walk as believers together, when they see us loving like Jesus, loving one another like Jesus, this is what they need to see. They need to see people, believers in Jesus Christ, who love one another and are led by the Holy Spirit, deal with each other with grace and understanding and forgiveness and love. We need to join and be obedient the mission of God to let his light shine through us because we live with forgiveness in our hearts. We went to a conference a couple weeks ago, and the speaker said this, those of us that have been forgiven by Jesus Christ we got better be the best forgivers ever. And I've known too many people that walk away from churches because they get, a, they get a bee in their bonnet about something. And like it, you almost get the impression they'd have been happy to pour out gasoline and throw a match over their shoulder on the way out. My friends, this ought not be so. We don't act like that. We love one another. We listen to one another. We... We serve one another sacrificially. So let's not be like what happened at that conference where we stir up disunity. Let's love one another truly through it. There are people in this room that you disagree with. Hey, in love, have that conversation. Love one another through it. Let's let that be what we show this old broken, dying world, that we're not like them. We don't respond the same way. We don't treat each other the same way. We love and forgive, and are merciful. Amen? Amen? Let's be that. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus came to us in our brokenness and loved us through it. Thank you, Lord, for 1 John 1, 9. That if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May we be the best forgivers in the world. May, may we walk not hate our brothers and sisters, but love them sacrificially like Jesus loved us. When Jesus loved us, the, Christ loved us in this way. He died for us. May we be willing to sacrifice for one another and love each other through disagreements, love each other through preferences, love each other through uh, offenses. May we be obedient to Jesus by loving him sacrificially and loving each other sacrificially. May we walk as he walked and, and reflect this, God. May we not miss the big one, the one commandment that you have for us. May we love you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And may we love one another as Christ loved the church. Father, thank you for challenging us today. May we show this old broken world that you are a God who loves us and that has taught us what love is. It's in your son's name. Amen. Hey, let's get out there and love people, shall we? You're dismissed. <laughs>